Tonight, I want to take our collective time. I wonder how many people have had to wrestle with God. You've had to wrestle with God. Well, let me say it strong, more strongly. How many have been disappointed by God? Amen. God has, in your, in your sense, uh, let you down. He didn't come through for you. It's probably something you wouldn't readily say out loud. Sounds very unspiritual that God has disappointed you. God has let you down. He hasn't come through like you hoped he would, believed he would, thought he would. Well, you're not alone. The Bible has stories in it of people who didn't feel like God knew what he was doing who felt let down by the deity, who felt abandoned, who felt confused, who felt that God wasn't there when they needed him. Particularly if it's something major, something that's not just a run of the mill, but something that was uh, terribly significant. And you felt God was just not there for you. Of course, this is the question of Job. He wanted to know why do the righteous suffer? He didn't understand. And even his friends couldn't help him out. Trying to figure out why he was suffering. the truth would be told, me and God have been wrestling. Me and God have been wrestling with why he took Sister Evans at this particular point when there was so much prayer, so much expectation, so many signals of healing, and things went in the other direction. So the reality is most, if not all, have those times in our lives when we struggle with God. When the statement that his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts becomes very real in your situation. Because in light of what happened, he sure wasn't thinking what you were thinking. And his ways sure wasn't the ways that you at plan things to work out. So these are real questions. One biblical writer, one biblical author who raised this question that I've mentioned from time to time is the prophet Habakkuk. Three chapters of this minor prophet if your pages get stuck together in the Bible, you'll miss it. <laughs> For it's only a couple of pages in the Bible. I would tell you it comes after Nahum, but that won't help many of you. <laughs> comes right before Haggai, and that would help, won't help many of you either. But between Nahum and Haggai is the prophet Habakkuk. Habakkuk gives us some of his sentiments in verse 2 of the first chapter when he says, How long, O Lord, will I call for help? And you will not hear. I cry out to you, violence, yet you do not save. Anybody feel him here? His question is, how long do I have to pray about this? Talk to you about this? Plead with you about this? And heaven is silent. 
He has a question in verse two. He says, why? His first question is how long? Now his question is why? Why do you make me see iniquity, cause me to look at wickedness, yet destruction and violence are before me? Strife exists, contention arises. He wants to know first how long, and now he wants to know why. Isn't that our question? Why? Why? I asked that question today, actually. Not only did, you know, why did you take Sister Evans? But why in one of the exams wasn't it discovered earlier so it could have been dressed earlier? That was a why too. I mean, we, we get to these exams every year. Why wasn't it caught earlier when it could have been arrested? So you ask why? So he says, how long? And then he says, why? To show you how infected and affected he was by his confusion. Chapter three, verse 16, he says, I heard and my inward parts trembled. At the sound, my lips quivered. Decay entered my bones, and in my place I tremble, because I must wait quietly for the day of distress, for the people to rise who will invade us. To make that short, he says, I'm unraveling. I tremble at the outlook of what I see coming. Here's a man, a prophet of God who is hurting deeply. Now the backdrop of this book is God is bringing judgment on his people for their idolatry and their rebellion against him and he's going to use the Babylonians to bring the judgment. And Habakkuk the prophet is struggling with number one, the fact of judgment, and number two, he's going to use people worse than the Israelites to do the judging. And he can't figure out God's thinking. Can't figure out God's perspective. He makes a statement that we've all either heard or said in chapter 3, verse 20, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. In other words, all your talking is not going to be able to figure this out. All your talking, your crying, your weeping, your complaining. And all you got to do is read the book of Job because that's 42 chapters of talk. And in chapter 42, they are no clearer in their understanding. He's no clearer. He does not know about chapter one. And he's never told about chapter one, about why He's in this predicament that he's in. So Habakkuk is struggling with the why question, the how long question, and the not being able to figure it out. And all he can do is be silent. Now, in the secular world, they would offer us a number of suggestions about facing this kind of situation when the world doesn't make sense. Some would encourage us to resignation. That is, well, I just have to accept it 
because there's nothing I can do about my despair. So they resign themselves. What will be will be, and that's just how it is. So that's one approach when you're in despair and you don't know your way out of it, just to resign and say, huh, that's it. Another approach to dealing with despair and disappointment is detachment. One is resignation, the other is detachment. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to deal with it. So I'm going to find something to distract me from it. Whether it's amusement, entertainment, whether it's drugs, relationship, whether it was something so that I don't have to think about it because this distracts me. This puts me in another mental zone. Sometimes it's the bed. I just want to sleep so that I don't have to think about it. The problem with detachment is Your despair knows how to work around it. It knows how to seep in when those gaps come. It knows how to bring something to mind or somebody say something or do something that brings it back. So you got to keep finding more escape to detach you from the pain of the problem and the difficulty. So some people resign, others detach. Then there are the he-men, the bravado. These are the ones who say, well, hold your chin up. You, 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 you gonna beat this. Is that just determination to kind of just grit your teeth And just by sheer determination, you're going to overrule this thing that is crushing you. So there are many ways that people seek to beat their despair. When the questions are how long and why, and as he says, I tremble in my despair. But I want to offer you, through the prophet Habakkuk, another approach when God does not make sense. When you are disappointed with him, frustrated with him, when in your quiet moments, and you're not trying to be particularly spiritual or religious, you're just trying to be honest with God, respectful but honest. Habakkuk helps me out, helps us out in verses 17 to 19 of chapter 3. Though the fig tree should not blossom and there be no fruit on the vine, Though the yield of the olive should fall, fail and the fields produce the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stall. Now let's pause right there. He says Though the circumstances are bleak, all of those are ways of talking about things that are not working out. Fig trees that don't blossom, vines that don't have grapes on them, <laughs> the olives are being coming from the olive trees, and the fields are barren, not producing food. All that's bleak. He says, though, though this is the reality, y 
yet, verse 18, I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength and he has made my feet like hinds feet and makes me walk on my high places. Let's spend a few moments here. I want to center for a moment on two words. His situation is bleak. His circumstances are out of his control because most of these problems are tied to the fact there is no rain and he can't make it rain. It's out of his control. You, you can't you can't do anything more to make it better. In our situation, uh, there was nothing we were not willing to do and nothing that was within our control that we didn't try. It was totally, we couldn't make it rain. We couldn't make it rain. It was out of our control. That's his situation here. But then he utters two words. Very important words. He says, I will. Now, stay with me here. He says, I will. But what he decides to do goes against how he feels. See, we've been already told how he feels. He's got all these questions, and he says in 16, he's in distress. So we know what his emotions are doing. They're, they're, they've hit rock bottom. No cattle, no fruit, no food, no... No, his emotions are, are, are flat, but he makes a choice. Says, I will. Sometimes faith and feelings get along. Sometimes you feel faithish. Faith and Faith and feelings have become partners. And you, you, you feel in this thing. This thing is bubbling up in you. It's, it's, uh, they're working together, but sometimes they get divorced. Your will must always be the engine. Your emotions must always be the caboose. The moment the caboose is pulling the train, your journey is in trouble. And that is because you can't always control how you feel. Feelings change all the time based on influences, impacts, circumstances, situations. Happy, sad, glad, mad, frustrated, irritated, exacerbated. You know, feelings are all over the place. You're crying one minute, you're laughing the next. I, I, I walked in the house, just, just walked in the house from the office. I think it was yesterday. I walked across the door and I just broke out crying. I just broke out crying, just weeping like a baby. I didn't plan that, that wasn't scheduled. But just crossing that precipice, I just broke down and started crying. There's another time, I just passed by a picture. I just broke out crying. Didn't plan it. But the emotions 
took over at that moment. So you never, you can never ignore the reality of emotions. Emotions, how you feel is real. And your emotions are never to be dismissed like they don't exist or that they don't matter. But what he did was say, I will. I'm going to make a decision in spite of my distress and despair, in spite of unanswered questions about how long and unanswered questions why, I'm going to make a decision. I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. I will do that. I have made a choice, as we would say in more contemporary language, to praise him anyhow. Not to praise him for what I'm feeling, but to praise him in the midst of what I'm feeling. I will praise him. Says, I will exalt in the Lord, the God of my salvation. He says, I will rejoice. Uh, I'm going to, when you read the Psalms, you see this regularly. David praising God while in the midst of describing pain. So he's describing pain. Psalm 42, you know, he's looking at all the negatives, he says, but I will yet praise him. I will yet praise him. He, he makes a decision. When God has disappointed you, let you down, hurt you, and you don't understand why, and he hasn't at least yet answered your questions. The way I'm going to get through this, he says, is through my praise. And if I'm looking to my feelings to give me the motivation to praise, they can't help me. Because there's no cattle in the stall. <laughs> no figs on the tree. No crop on the ground. My circumstances won't give me the mm that I need. So you can come to church and if the sermon is right and if the choir is right, you can get a little mm. Get a little mm, you know, a little mm. But by the time you get home, that's because you are piggybacking off of somebody else. But he's talking about his own will. I will. Rejoice, celebrate the God of my salvation, even though my situation has changed. What is the result of this celebration? Because with the celebration, watch this now, comes a change of focus. He's talked about his problem. He hadn't, he hadn't, he hadn't dismissed his problem, but what he has done is shifted his focus. I'm going to focus on the God of my salvation. In the book of, um, of Job, God from chapter 38 to 42 is describing how awesome and great he is to Job and how Job really doesn't understand much. And, and uh, Job says in 42, he says, I've heard about you with the hearing of the ear, but now I've seen you with my own eyes. And I repent in sackcloth and ashes. His God focused didn't change his problem, but it changed his perspective in the midst of his problem. Amen. 
what happened when he, by his will, in spite of his circumstances, got his praise on? Verse 19, the Lord God is my strength. When you're in despair, by the nature of its impact on you, you are weak. You're either physically weak or emotionally weak, psychologically weak, circumstantially weak. You're just weak. You get up and go, it's gotten up and gone. You're weak. He says, but the Lord has given him strength. Strength didn't come because the circumstance changed. Strength came because God entered into his equation. In your despair, don't fall into the trap of drawing from him rather than drawing to him. And then he goes further. And get this, he's gotten strength. And he has made my feet like hinds feet and makes me walk on my high places. Let me read that again. He's given me strength, verse 18. And he has made my feet like hinds feet and makes me walk on my high places. The picture here is of a mountain goat or a mountain deer. He's talking about high places, mountains. You have to climb a mountain. The beauty of a mountain goat or a mountain deer is sure-footedness while they climb. They have the unique ability because of the strength in their legs to climb the mountain without falling into potholes or pits. They're able to navigate the terrain of the mountain. Now, I know we would all prefer it to read, and he makes my high places disappear. <laughs> I would prefer that, that my high places disappeared. I would love that. But what he did was, he says, what God did was strengthen my legs. Because he made my feet like Heinz's feet. He did something with my strength. He did not cancel the mountain. He changed my footwork. both by strengthening me and showing me how to navigate the terrain. When you are driving and you cross a bridge, usually means there is something that's dangerous below you. A bridge is connecting two points of contact usually over something, a body of water, a valley of some kind, something that if the bridge was not there, you either couldn't cross it, or if you tried, you would plunge to disaster. Bridges aren't designed to eradicate the danger. They're just designed as a path to get you across it. The bridge that God gives is 
strength. And the strength, he says, is the Lord God, is my strength. He has changed my footwork and makes me walk on high places. He gives me the ability to climb this mountain and to navigate the terrain. Sounds a lot like the end of Isaiah 40, doesn't it? They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. Run, not grow weary. Walk in that thing. They will, they will be able to keep going when in your own humanity you want to quit. I would love, I would love to be able to say that when we follow God, the mountains disappear. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they do. But there are those times when they don't. And you have to learn to become a spiritual mountain climber. You have to ask God for strength. But he got the strength in his rejoicing. Right now, and I know it's still early on for me, I have to start my day asking the Lord for strength for today. And to say, even sometimes with tears rolling down, I'm going to praise you anyhow. Sometimes I have to do that. I have questions. Why? I have questions. Don't understand. I have questions. Why now? There are a lot of reasons for those questions that time will not allow me to get into. Nowhere to be appropriate, but just a lot of questions. We all have why questions. If you haven't had one, keep living. There'll be a why question. And you praise God if you get an answer, because many times he does give answers. But there are sometimes he doesn't explain himself. So if I were to entitle this time with you tonight, I would simply call it trusting God in the dark. Trusting God when there's great lack of clarity. When he has not made himself inextricably clear. When you have to wonder what he's doing, why he's doing it, why is he doing it now? Why is he doing it in this way? Why does it hurt so bad? Why does it hurt this long? Praise God for those times when he gives you a clear answer. But according to Rebecca, praise him even when he doesn't. And let him give you new strength. And so what I want from tonight, what I want to encourage you tonight, is to make your praise a way of life so that when you get into this situation, you don't have to start from scratch. You don't have to start from the beginning because you, you, you're beginning your day just worshiping him, surrendering to him, and praising him. But it's also... while we need one another. Because sometimes you need somebody to help you praise because it just ain't coming out. You know, it ain't, it ain't coming out. So we can encourage one another. So may God help us as we move forward 
in ministry as a church and in your individual lives to trust him in the dark like we do in the light. 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 They abandon their families, abandon their children because they are abandoning the blessing. Dr. Tony Evans tells men who fail to pass on a spiritual heritage to their children that it's not too late. I don't care how long you've been defeated as a man. Jesus Christ is standing over you today saying, get up because Jesus loves you. Celebrating 40 years of faithfulness, this is The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans, author, speaker, senior pastor of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas, Texas, and president of The Urban Alternative. Blessings come from God, but not just from God. Today, Dr. Evans will touch on the importance of the blessings we pass on and what to do if they were never passed on to us. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 25 as we join him. Fatherlessness dominates our cultural landscape today. 40% of all children in our country are raised without their biological father. In the African-American community, 72% of children born are born to single parents. Whether you're looking at crime statistics or dropout statistics or teenage pregnancy statistics or poverty statistics, over and over and over again, the dominating reality of fatherlessness overwhelms us. Now, fatherlessness comes in many shapes and many forms. Some are fatherless because they've been abandoned by their father. Their father sired a child that they were not willing to take responsibility for. Other forms of fatherlessness is that the father may be there, but he might as well not be there because he's not accepted the responsibility of fatherhood. And so what we have developed is a generation of young people, children, who are growing up in a fatherless environment, and so they go seeking pseudo-fatherhood. Things that look like it could be a father for me, whether it's a gang or whether it's their posse or their homies or whether some other influence that's not in their best interest. Fatherlessness has become the daunting, overwhelming, painful reality of our culture that is fraying us. When God created man, he, before he gave him a wife and gave him children, he gave him the responsibility to act on his behalf. But now we have men who are simply satisfied to say, I'm not happy. Let me take a moment to talk about happy. <laughs> I'm not against happy. I'm for happy. You should want to be happy. There's no, there's no benefit to being miserable. On the other hand, happy is not your first order of business. Your first order of business is to be responsible, whether or not you're happy. Because the measure of a man is his acceptance of responsibility under God as he seeks to be happy. But what we are having today are men, because they're no longer happy, abandoning responsibility. And so we are finding ourselves enveloped in a cursed environment because of the crisis of fatherlessness. In our passage today, we have a son begging for the blessing of his father. Esau is begging for a blessing. You must strip your mind about the casual use of the word bless. We say, you know, God bless you, I bless you. We use the word fairly casually today many times. But when Esau was asking daddy to bless him, he wasn't just saying, daddy say, I bless you. No, the blessing was speaking about something else. It was speaking about the continuity of the covenant. A symbol for...
or the word blessing was covenantal continuity. Let me explain what I mean. It is my hope that every head of a household here has a will. If you do not have a will, you're not operating responsibly. A will simply says, this is what I want to happen with what I've been entrusted with to pass on to the next generation. A will speaks of an inheritance, usually related to stuff. In fact, folk gather when wills are read with their fingers crossed, hoping that there's a little something, something in there for them. Or more importantly, a whole lot of something, something in there for them. In our story, Jacob, the younger, wants the blessing. So he concocts a plan with his mother, Rebecca, to steal the blessing from the older son, Esau. And so while Esau went out to hunt to get food in order to bring it back to his father, for him to get the blessing, Rebecca told Jacob, look, what you do is you go get me a goat. I'll cook the meal. You go put on your brother's clothes because your father can't see. It says his eyes were dim. He won't be able to see. You go in there with your brother's clothes and you uh, bring the meal that your brother's supposed to bring and let him bless you. So Jacob does that. He goes, gets the goat. The mother cooks the goat. He goes, puts on his brother's clothes. He walks in. His father... Isaac says, who's that? Who's that? Who's that? And Jacob says, no, it's me. It's Esau, your oldest son. He says, I have your food. He says, come close to me. He says, now you feel like Esau, but you sound like Jacob. It says in verse 23, he did not recognize him. And so he blesses him. I'll talk about that in a moment. All I want you to get now is how critical the blessing was. He was willing to join partners with his mama against his daddy in order to get it. Because this thing involved his future. Now this raises a question. Because obviously Jacob is wrong and Rebecca is wrong because they're tricking Isaac. Yet, Throughout the Bible, God praises Jacob and not Esau. Even though Jacob is doing the wrong thing. The question is why? Well, you need chapter 25 to answer that. If you go back a page to chapter 25, verse 27. When the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field. He's the athlete. Jacob was a peaceful man living in tents. Now, Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game, because he's the athlete, and Rebekah loved Jacob. When Jacob had cooked stew, because he's hanging with mama, so when he had cooked stew, Esau came in from the field and was famished, starving. So Esau says to Jacob, verse 30, please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I am famished. Verse 31, Jacob says, first sell me your birthright. Sell me the rights of the firstborn and I give you some meat. Esau said, behold, I'm about to die. I'm so hungry. So of what use is a birthright to me if I'm a starve to death? And Jacob said, first swear to me that you'll give me your birthright, the rights of the firstborn. So he swore to him, and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Here it is. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Esau thought so little of his birthright, he was willing to give it up for some food. As far as Esau was concerned, stay with me, there was no connection between my birthright and my blessing. My birthright is over here and my blessing is over there. But when you read Hebrews chapter 12, verses 16 and 17, it says, don't be like the immoral, godless Esau 
who sold his birthright for food. The problem with Esau is he was only present oriented. He only wanted what he wanted now because he wasn't thinking about the future later. One of the problems we have among men is they're present oriented. I'm not happy now. I don't want the responsibility now. It's all about now. It's not all about now. It is about you passing forward the blessing. That is the divine statement of God from you to you and through you because you are future oriented. He gets tricked. But God doesn't interfere with it because he didn't value his birthright. Now you may say, I don't have a birthright. Oh yeah, you do. If you've accepted Jesus Christ, you've been born again. You possess a birthright. There are rights and privileges that come with your new birth, but those rights and privileges incur responsibility. And sometimes you'll be happy and sometimes you won't be happy, but that's what's that got to do. Sometimes you want to work and sometimes you don't want to work. You better get up if you want to eat. In other words, responsibility has to function whether or not happiness is part of the equation. Although there's nothing wrong with being happy. But that means you must be future oriented if you're going to pass on the blessing. So what does that blessing include? Well, we'll find out when Dr. Evans returns to continue our message in just a moment. Stay with us. Nearly a decade ago, Dr. Evans released his instant bestseller, Kingdom Man. And today we're excited to announce his long-awaited follow-up book, Kingdom Men Rising. Filled with authentic stories of struggle and heartfelt personal loss, Tony takes us to God's Word to show men how to clear all obstacles in the journey that leads to living a life of influence and impact. Replace hopelessness, boredom, and regret with power, significance, and influence. Get kingdom men rising for yourself or for someone you love. Makes a great gift for husbands, sons, fathers, cousins, pastors, athletes, coaches, and more. Grab yours at TonyEvans.org or at your nearest bookstore or online retailer. Men, it's time to rise up and claim your culture for Christ. The future of our families and our society depends on men stepping up to their God-given responsibility as leaders. And that's why we want you to have a copy of Kingdom Men Rising as our gift. Just visit TonyEvans.org before the end of the week, make a contribution toward Tony's ministry, and we'll say thanks by sending the book your way, along with all 12 full-length audio lessons in his current series, Kingdom Men Rising. And if you're interested in digging even deeper, or to help you share this material with your family or small group, be sure to check out the companion Kingdom Men Rising Bible Study. Again, that's TonyEvans.org. Or call 1-800-800-3222, where resource team members are standing by around the clock. I'll have that information for you again after part two of today's lesson. Here's Tony. And so we have Esau begging for a blessing. I mean, he's saying, please, daddy. How many men here today were raised by a single mother? You were raised by a single mother, numbers of you. And praise God for the great job that so many of our single women do. But all a mother can be is the best mother she can be. She was never meant to have dual roles when there should be a man in the picture. He says, Father, bless me. Because that's what the father is supposed to do. He's supposed to pass it on. And the next generation should feel God all over them. If you've got kids in your house, pass that on to me. Now, what did the blessing include? In chapter 27, we're told, first of all, his father kissed him, verse 26. Please come close and kiss me because the blessing included an intimate touch. He says, here's the blessing, my son. Verse 28 and 29, may God give you of the dew of heaven, of the fatness of earth, of the abundance of grain and wine. May people serve you and nations bow down to you. May you be master of your brethren and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed is he who curses you and blessed are those who bless you. 
God reached all the way back to the Abrahamic covenant. Abraham passed it on to Isaac. Isaac is now passing it on to Jacob where it should have been passed on to Esau who turned away his birthright. You know what the covenant was? You know what the blessing was? Divine favor moving forward. Divine favor moving forward. The blessing was future inheritance from God. Please notice the language. May God do this. May God do that. May God do this. May God do that. See, that's where the blessing is missing. We're just saying, I want you to do this and I want you to do that. Oh, you want to be a doctor. You want to be a lawyer. You want to be an engineer. You want to be a teacher. Nothing wrong with that. But the blessing was what God would do. I want God to do this. I want God to do that. I want God to do the other. I want God. It was about God, 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 God. Not just what I want for you or what you want for you, but what God wants for you. That was the blessing. Because it would happen because of God. Whenever you see a caterpillar, that's got a glorious future. Now I know what you're looking at right now ain't much. When that thing cocoons, it's going to be pretty and it's going to take flight. we got a generation of children who don't take flight. They're still crawling because they've never been blessed. They've never had the blessing stand over them to affirm them and to speak God into them, not just stuff for them, but God into them who will bring them the appropriate stuff. Your will must be more than stuff. My will must be more than stuff. It must be God and the transfer of divine favor. When I was growing up in Baltimore, we went duck pin bowling. Now things were pretty rinky-dink. This wasn't high-class bowling. And a lot of times machines didn't fully work. So pins, sometimes all of them wouldn't get picked up. So some would still be laying down. Other time, the machine would pick them up and one would drop out of it and fall back down. There was this guy. Now, you couldn't see him. All you could see is his feet. And all he went was from lane to lane picking up pins that the machine couldn't get. So he run into this lane, run into that lane, run into this lane. He picking up stuff that got knocked down and that the machine couldn't pick up so the next person to bowl. I don't care how long you've been knocked down. I know somebody who can pick you back up and set you right again because he wants you to have the blessing. The forward-moving favor of God commuted to you so you can commute it to yours. I've told a man how much I, I love Rocky V. I love all the Rockies, but really love Rocky V. Rocky five, Rocky is retired because he's gotten bruised and beaten. His eye is bad. He can't fight anymore in Rocky five. He comes across a young upcoming fighter named Tommy Gunn. And Tommy Gunn has admired Rocky Balboa as he followed his career. And so they meet and become friends. And he says to Rocky Balboa, Rocky, Italian stallion, will you, will you train me? Rocky said, boy, yeah, that, I can stay in the fight game by helping you. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll train you. So Rocky works with him. And Tommy Gunn goes up the ladder, up the ladder, up the ladder, and becomes the heavyweight champion of the world due to the influence of Rocky Balboa. The movie comes down to the last 15 minutes. The whole movie zeroes in on that last 15 minutes. See, Tommy Gunn has now become the champion of the world and has gotten to his head. So he's gotten a lot of money, man. He's gotten a lot of attention, a lot of notoriety in the news. So Tommy Gunn is, is living large and he doesn't need Rocky anymore. In fact, he gets belligerent with Rocky. In that last 15 minutes, they're in a, a gathering and Tommy Gunn hits Rocky Balboa's wife's husband, his brother-in-law. I mean, he clocks him and knocks him down because of some argument they were having. Then Tommy Gunn insults Rocky and insults Rocky's son. 
Then Tommy Gunn dares Rocky to do anything about it. Rocky tears off his shirt and the rumble begins. They out in the street fighting each other. It's a street fight. The problem is Tommy Gunn is too young, too strong, and too fast. And so while Rocky is doing the best he can, he can't keep up with this young guy. And so it comes down to a punch that Tommy Gunn throws and he hits Rocky and he sends Rocky down in the gutter, beaten man. While in the gutter. While down and out. Rocky remembers. Up on the screen above his head, it shows what he's thinking. So he thinks back to Rocky 1 and Rocky 2. And he remembers Apollo Creed and how he fought and became champion of the world. And when he remembered Apollo Creed, he tried to get up, but he couldn't. Then he remembered Clubber Lang, Rocky Three, And how Clubber Lang had beaten him, but how he fought back to win back the championship. And when he remembered, he tried to get up, but he couldn't. Then he remembered Ivan Drago, the Russian monster. And how he went over to Russia and defeated him on his own turf so that the Russians were singing the national anthem. And he remembered that and he tried to get up, but he couldn't. But then he remembered somebody else. He remembered his old coach, Mickey. Now, Mickey had died in Rocky Four. Mickey was already dead, but he remembers Mickey. When Mickey was standing over him saying, get up, get up, get up, you bum. Because Mickey loves you. Now that's when the music came on. Dum, 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 dum. Music comes on and Rocky Balboa, he stands up. He shakes it off. Tommy Gunn is walking off in the distance. Rocky Balboa looks in the distance and says, Yo, Tommy, one more round. He found strength he didn't have and power he didn't possess. And he was able to defeat the young buck. Why was he able to defeat him? Because he remembered somebody who had died, who had then come alive again to remind him of what he could do. I don't care how long you've been down in the gutter as a man, how long you've been defeated as a man. Jesus Christ is standing over you today saying, get up, get up, get up, you bum, because Jesus loves you. So it's time to take your stand and being the man and father God has called you to be. But the only way to connect with that calling is through a personal connection with Christ, which begins by admitting we can't make it to heaven on our own. From there, His sacrifice on the cross is the only way to bridge the gap between our failure and God's forgiveness. If you've never made that connection, visit TonyEvans.org today and follow the link that says Jesus. There, Dr. Tony Evans will explain everything you need to know about what it means to be a real Christian and how to start a brand new life. In the time we have remaining, I want to mention that today's lesson is part of Tony's powerful series called Kingdom Men Rising. There are 12 full-length messages in this collection containing bonus content we won't have time to present on the air. As I mentioned...
mentioned earlier, it's yours as our thank you gift when you make a contribution to help us keep Tony's teaching on the station. Along with it, we'll also send you his just-released companion book, Kingdom Men Rising. Time is running out on this special offer, so visit TonyEvans.org today to get the details and make the arrangements. While you're there, you can also request the comprehensive Kingdom Men Rising Bible Study to use on your own or to share with your small group. Again, that's TonyEvans.org. Or reach out to our Resource Center at 1-800-800-3222, where team members are always on hand to help you. That's 1-800-800-3222. Well, tomorrow, Dr. Evans will talk about how men need each other and explain why what they learn during worship time should change what they do at dinner time. I hope you'll join us. The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans is brought to you by The Urban Alternative and is celebrating 40 years of faithfulness thanks to the generous contributions of listeners like you. It's easy when you've gone from nothing to something to forget how you got there. Dr. Tony Evans says there's lasting importance in recognizing who it is that lifts and sustains you. Don't forget that God is your source. Celebrating 40 years of faithfulness, this is The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans, author, speaker, senior pastor of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas, Texas, and president of The Urban Alternative. There are times when the path ahead of us may look impassable, but Dr. Evans says we need to remember how God has established a record of helping His children successfully navigate treacherous ways. Let's join him as he elaborates. Israel had been in the wilderness for 40 years. 40 years for them to learn faith. 40 years for their habits to be corrected. 40 years for them to be humbled. 40 years for them to be trained. And now it was time to cross over at the end of the 40th year. And what a miracle crossover it was. I mean, it was something to behold. Because we're told when they crossed over the Jordan, they crossed over the Jordan in flood season. Now, if there's any time you don't want to cross the Jordan, it's in flood season. That's the most dangerous time. That's the time when you're most likely to run into a problem or to to drown. It was the time when the human capacity would be at its lowest. But I just want you to know God does some of his best work in flood season. When the waters are too high, the problems are too great, the needs are too daunting. In other words, where it's beyond you. Where God makes it hard in order for you to see there's only one God and you and I, we are not he. And so it was in flood season that God would perform this miracle. It was no different than when the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea. They got Pharaoh coming on one end. They got the Red Sea on the other end. They're in a catch-22. They're in a conundrum. They can go neither way and find a solution that unless God shows up and does something supernatural. So by way of application, if you happen today to be in flood season, being overwhelmed by life's realities and life's circumstance, you may not be in as bad position as it looks because it may be the impeccable season for the almighty God to demonstrate how exactly almighty he is. So God told them in flood season to tell the priest to take the Ark of the Covenant which contained the Ten Commandments, the Word of God, and to tell the priest to put their foot in the bank of the Jordan. Why? Because before you can ever see what God does in flood season, he wants to see you walking by faith. He doesn't want to see you talking by faith or feeling by faith. He wants to see you moving by faith. So he says, let the priest put their foot on the bank. I got to see that they're going to trust me. And so he gets these representatives, the principle of representation. So the representatives on behalf of the nation put their foot in the Jordan and a couple of miracles took place. 
During flood season, God blocked the water from flowing down the Jordan River so that now God walled them off, dammed them up so that the water would stop flowing. That was one miracle in and of itself. But then the Bible says they crossed over on dry land. Not wet land, dry land. It had to be land where they could walk over and their feet not get muddy, where they could roll wheelbarrows of, of their goods and not get stuck in the mud, where horses could still trot across, walk across and run across and not get stuck in waters that for years and centuries and decades had been wet. But the Bible says God not only damned the water, he hardened the soil so that when they walked over, they walked over on dry land. You, you need to understand who we're dealing with here. And it all happened in flood season. It was in this context of the supernatural intervention of God uh, that God tells Joshua to get a representative, again, the principle of representative, where the leaders would represent the 12 tribes of Israel to go back into the dry Jordan and pick up a boulder, a stone. Now, this wasn't a pebble. This was a major stone because he had to carry it. It says each one on his shoulder. So it was a major rock. And he says, what I want you to do with this rock is I want you to build a memorial. I want you to build stones of remembrance. I want you to build something so you'll never forget what was done here and who did it. I want you never to forget that the only way you got to where you are from where you came from is because God brought you in flood season from where you were to where you are. I don't want you to get the big head. I don't want you to think that it is by your power or your might that you are in this place 40 years later. I want you to have a perpetual reminder that the only reason you are where you are today versus where you were 40 years ago is because I supernaturally intervened into your situation. Now, why does God want to build, tell Joshua, to build a memorial? Because God knows we are subject to forget. God knows we're prone to forget. And while you may forget a lot of things in life, God is not the one you want to forget. I want to show you a few other scriptures that drives this home. In Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 9, we're told these words, Only give heed to yourself, give heed to yourself, and keep your soul diligent so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen and that they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life but make them known to your sons and your grandsons. In chapter 6, verse 10, then it shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you great and splendid cities which you did not build, and houses full of all good things which you did not fill, and huge cisterns which you did not dig, Vineyards and olive trees, which you did not plant, and you eat and are satisfied, then watch yourself that you do not forget the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. Look at chapter 8, verse 11. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his ordinances, and his statutes, which I am commanding you today verse 14 then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery verse 18 but you shall remember the Lord your God for it is he who is giving you power to make wealth that he may confirm his covenant which he swore to your fathers as it is this day it shall come about if you ever forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them. I surely against you today will testify and you shall surely perish like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you. Do you get the message? You better not forget. I like that phrase in chapter six. 
You better watch yourself. Because it's easy to forget. It's easy to think you're your own source. It's easy to think it's all on you, about you, from you, to you, through you, and because of you. It's easy when you've gone from nothing to something to forget how you got there. Don't forget that God is your source. Don't forget that where you are now compared to where you were when you met me is not the same place because I walk with you even in your, your rebellion, even in your disobedience, even in your disregard. He says, I fed you in the wilderness. I clothed you in the wilderness. I preserved you even when you were out of fellowship with me. So he says, uh, in fact, if the truth were told, if we, many of us would have got what we deserve, we wouldn't even be here today. If God didn't protect us in that situation, deliver us out of that situation, we wouldn't even be here today. But because God oversaw us and didn't let what could have happened, happen, and he preserved us and walked us through it, he says, don't you forget. And so he tells them, I want you to build the stone a memorial. He says, do not forget the goodness of God. That he alone is your source. And when we align ourselves to God like he wants us to align ourselves to him, he says, you will see me even in flood season. Demonstrate your glory. So he sends them. He sends them to get the stones. You know, we, we believe in reminders. We have Memorial Day parades. You know, that's a reminder of the people who have sacrificed their lives for our freedom in America. And so they have a, because they don't want you to forget. There's an Independence Day parade on July 4th and all kind of independent celebrations to remind us of the battle from England that led to the founding of the nation. Why? Because they don't want you to forget. When I was in Washington, D.C., not too long ago, there are memorials. There's the Jefferson Memorial, the Lincoln Memorial, the Martin Luther King Memorial. Why? So you don't forget. They've got the great statements by these statesmen uh, on the walls so that you can be reminded of what it took for us to be here. What they're trying to say is we don't want you to forget. What God is saying is if men who come and go don't want you to forget them, what do you think about the God who doesn't want you to forget him? Because let me tell you, the big difference between folk who don't want to be forgotten and God who says don't forget me the folk who don't want to be forgotten when they're gone they're gone <laughs> you can't go to them for anything else you can't reach them you couldn't even reach them when they were alive you sure can't reach them now that they've died so they can do absolutely nothing from their memorial but the God who brought you from yesterday is alive today and you're going to need him tomorrow so you better not forget. See, that's the problem today. The problem today is everybody wants to remember God for what he can give them, not for who he is. In flood season, when you were between a rock and a hard place at the Red Sea, when you didn't know how you were going to get out of this one, when you didn't know whether you were going to make it, when other folk gave up on you and you saw no way out, remember that I showed up and I met you in that place. Do not forget the Lord your God. And so, gather the stones. Gather the stones. And when you gather these stones, there's going to be a question. And the question is, what do these stones mean? A memorial should always provoke a question. What does this mean? We have trophies in the fellowship center. We've got a trophy case, all kinds of trophies from different things, different teams have won from our sports ministries. Trophies. 
people don't even stop at the trophy case anymore. You know, you, you, you know they're there if you've been over there, but you don't stop to read it anymore. You know why? Because all of that is representative of the past. Every trophy in there is yesterday's news. And so you know they're there, but you don't go read them anymore. You don't go look at them. Even the people who participate in the championship, don't, don't revisit them. Because it's yesterday's news. The reason why God doesn't want to forget you is that he's not just yesterday's news. I love his name. He told Moses, I am that I am. I personal pronoun am present tense. He's the right now God. So his trophy cases continue to be filled with current day realities of his presence and purpose in our lives individually and as a community. He's never old news. He says, I want you to build a memorial to remember, to cause my people to remember that I am the right now God based on the past. So he told Israel, circumcise your sons and every generation after that. He said, remember the Passover. And then in the New Testament, Jesus says around communion, remember me. Why? Because of what I do right now, based on what I have already done. Dr. Evans will have more on remembering God's faithfulness when he returns in just a moment. Stay with us. When the world says to man up, they're talking about things you can see. Money, status, social media followers. What does God say? To be a man and rise up in society, you can't leave God out of it. It's the difference between good and great. See, greatness isn't achieved, it's demonstrated every single day. Legacy is a million middle moments done well. In his sequel to the best-selling Kingdom Man, Tony Evans' Kingdom Men Rising challenges men to overcome the obstacles in their way in order to leave a legacy of influence. Get the book Kingdom Men Rising to discover how you can do just that. Find out more at TonyEvans.org. Also makes a great gift. All this month, we've been celebrating the release of this powerful new book by making available to our listeners a special package of resources that includes the Kingdom Men Rising book, along with all 12 full-length messages from the current Kingdom Men Rising series, available both on CD and digital download. This entire resource package is our gift to you, and thanks for your donation that helps us keep Tony's teaching here on this station. And if you want to explore this topic even further, Dr. Evans has created a custom Kingdom Men Rising Bible study that goes hand-in-hand with the book and audio messages. To request your copy of this powerful package, simply go online to TonyEvans.org to get the details and make your donation. This special double offer ends this weekend, however, so contact us right away to get your package. Again, you can do that at TonyEvans.org. Or call our 24-hour resource request line at 1-800-800-3222, where one of our friendly team members will be happy to help you with your request. I'll repeat that contact information for you after part two of today's message. Here's Tony. Everybody has a phone and everybody has a smartphone, which means everybody taking pictures of everything all the time. Pictures, 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 pictures. Everybody takes pictures. You know why people take pictures? To build memories. You take pictures because you want to remember something or someone or some circumstance. We got to be the most picture-taking family in the history of picture-taking families. We, we got volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes of picture books from over the years. I was looking with my son Anthony through one about a year ago. We're going through his, and I guess every kid got their own book. And we were going through, and one picture after another, and one picture after another, one picture after another. And he looked at me and he said, Daddy. I said, what? He said, we're going through this book, and I just noticed something. I said, what? He said, every page, you're there with me. You've been there all my life. If you turn the pages of your life and look close enough, you'll discover your heavenly father has been there all your life. Even in your unsaved days, you were covered enough for you to be here today. And so he says, I want you to build this memorial. And then he throws a zinger. He says, when your children ask you, 
What do these stones mean? Then you will say, because of the waters of Jordan were cut off, before the covenant of the Lord, it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, so these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. We are supposed to have a transferable faith. It's supposed to be transferred from one generation to the next generation. You know why we in the chaos we in today? Because there has been a transfer problem. We have a generation of young people who have not had their faith transferred by their mothers or fathers. And so there is a massive transfer problem. In verse 24, I love this. He says that all the people on the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty so that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Ooh, watch this, watch this. Israel, I'm going to bless you. Even though in the promised land, you're going to be surrounded by evil. They're going to be as Jericho, as AI, as all these evil people, the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites. They're still in the promised land. You, you're surrounded by evil. But in the middle of the evil that surrounds you, I got you. Uh, you got evil all around you, but I got you. But the reason I have you is so that the rest of the world may know. All them fools out there, all the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, I want them to know that I am in your midst because I want them to hear stories about you. I want them to hear the miracles I'm doing in your midst. I want them to hear the transformation of lives, the marriages that are saved, the dignity that is arising up, the spirituality that's taking place. I want to show off so that when they see out there what I'm doing in here, my name will be made great out there because I'm making it great in here. God has given us this promised land on Camp Wisdom, but it's just not for you and me. It's so that God can keep doing miracles on Camp Wisdom so the rest of Oak Cliff and Dallas and America can say, oh, God is showing up at 1800 block of Camp Wisdom because he keeps showing up there. How y'all able to do that? How you able to pay for that? How you able to change that? How you able to impact that? How you have the ability to own that? How do you ability to do that? And we can give and give testimony. It is to the Lord, our God, who met us in flood season. In your home, you may be surrounded by evil, but God says, if you remember the Lord, your God, even in your house, when you say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I don't care what the rest of the homes are doing around me. He says, I will make your home great because you remember me, even though you're surrounded by all kind of evil. So don't you be ashamed of God. Don't you be ashamed to name his name. Don't you be ashamed to do good works in his name. Don't you be ashamed to praise him. Don't you be ashamed to glorify him. If you don't want to hear about my God, if you don't want to hear about Jesus, then you can't have a long conversation with me. My job is to make his name great individually and our job is to do it collectively and no matter how big we get how high we get or what God gives us remember that when you're on the top of a pyramid you're only up there because something else is holding you up and if if something happens with the folk underneath you holding you up you come crashing down so no matter how high we get, it's God who's holding us up. And if God ever walks away from us, we will collapse. You will collapse. I will collapse. Because it's all about him. Dr. Tony Evans talking about the importance of always keeping God's faithfulness at the front of our minds. And with that, he's wrapped up his month-long series called Kingdom Men Rising. 
That means this is the last chance to take advantage of that special double offer I mentioned earlier. All 12 full-length messages in the series, bundled along with Tony's powerful new book, Kingdom Men Rising. We'll send them to you as our thank you gift when you help support this ministry with a generous contribution. And don't forget, Tony has created a complete companion Bible study that goes along with the Kingdom Men Rising series. Get all the details and make your request online at TonyEvans.org, where you can browse through our huge library of resources and sign up for Tony's free weekly email devotional. Again, that's TonyEvans.org. Or call us at 1-800-800-3222, where team members are standing by around the clock to help you with your resource request. Again, that's 1-800-800-3222. On Monday, Dr. Evans will take a thought-provoking look at why sin matters as he begins a brand new series called Consequences. Be sure to join us for that. The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans is brought to you by The Urban Alternative and is celebrating 40 years of faithfulness thanks to the generous contributions of listeners like you. 